So let me welcome you to week number five. This is week five of six in this series that we're calling Look Up because this is our intention to focus our, our attention on the soon return of Jesus and understand what the Bible says about the days in which we're living. We're learning to look up because Jesus said to us that when you are living in these kinds of days and you see all of these things uh, begin to come to pass, then we ought to look up. Now, last Sunday, if you will recall, we talked together about the next event on God's prophetic timeline, and that event is called the rapture of the church. We were discussing it last week, and I want to define it for you again in case you weren't here. Maybe you don't understand the term. Um, so let me, de- let me define it for you. The rapture of the church is when Jesus will suddenly remove his bride or remove the church from the earth before the events of the great tribulation. This is that moment of the catching away. We get the word rapture from the Greek word harpazo, and it means to snatch away or to be caught away quickly. Um, If you want to see a good biblical illustration of what that might look like, you can go to Acts chapter number 8, where the Bible describes a catching away of Philip after he shares the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch and he baptizes that eunuch uh, in the desert, then the Bible says that he is called away and the eunuch saw him no more. Literally, just like that, he was gone. And 1 Thessalonians tells us in chapter 4 that this will happen one day with the church. Christ will come, the dead in Christ will rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up, uh, taken out, in the rapture. And the Bible teaches, we are convinced, that that rapture will occur before the events of the great tribulation. Now, following the rapture, there will be, as we've discussed, a sequence of five unfolding end time events. And I've laid those out for you in previous weeks. But the first of those five events that will unfold is the rise of the Antichrist and the beginning of seven years of tribulation. And this is where we're going to focus our attention this morning. On this event known as the Great Tribulation or the time of tribulation and the leader of the world during that time, the Antichrist. We're going to be discussing the Antichrist, his, his character, Uh, his behavior, uh, his power, as we uh, study Revelation chapter number 13 today. Now, here's the prophetic sign, and I've been giving you a prophetic sign every single Sunday, so here it is for today. Jot it down in your notes. The last days will be a time of globalism. It's an important word. We'll talk about it a little more in a minute. The last days will be a time of globalism with one world ruler, one world religion, and one world economy. This is what the Bible teaches, that in the last days, the world will be marked with a globalism defined in one world ruler, one world religion, and one world economy. Now, all three of those things are found in Revelation chapter 13. And before we read the chapter, I'd love for you to mark each one of them if you have a pen. So on every campus, would you, would you circle or mark beginning in verse number 7, where this passage tells us about this one world ruler. In the middle of verse number 7, it says, Power was given uh, to him, that's the Antichrist, over all kindreds, all languages, And all nations. Power was given to this ruler over all the nations of the earth. And the word that's translated power here is the Greek word exousia. And it literally means the right to rule or the authority to reign. He is given the authority to reign over every nation. That's number one. It will be a time of one world power one world uh, world ruler. Secondly, it will be a time of one world uh, religion. Look at verse eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. There is one world religion, centralized worship of the entire world. All the world will worship him. 
And then thirdly, there will be a one world economy or currency. And you'll see this in verse number 17, if you'll mark it there. And that no man might buy or sell unless he had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes as well. But you have one world ruler. He has the authority to rule over all the earth. One world worship. All the world will worship him. And there will be one world currency or economy enforcing that global worship of this one world ruler. All of these things will mark the globalism ultimately during the tribulation period and which we're seeing more and more today. All right. So on every campus, follow along. Let's read this entire chapter. There are only 18 verses here. And you follow along as I begin in Revelation 13 and verse 1. So John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And I saw as one of his heads, as it were, was wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? There was given unto him, the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty-two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell there uh, dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all the kindreds and the tongues and the nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And this is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast. This beast was coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. And he, the second beast, exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, and that uh, an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that, had, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed." And he causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he, has the, he that had the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six, or six, six, six. And all God's people said, wow, <laughs> wow, what a passage. This passage describes, as you, as you heard in my reading, two beasts and a dragon. 
Now remember, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number one, God said that he had sent to his servant John this message signified that he might report it or write it and send it unto the churches. And in the book of Revelation, there is a lot of this symbolism. What John sees is in the form, in verse thir- chapter 13, of a dragon and two beasts. But these, this dragon and these beasts are representative of realities within the earth. And we're going to talk today about what these uh, symbols or what these images represent. Let's begin by identifying in the first place the dragon. We don't have to wonder who the dragon of verse number two is or verse number four when the Bible says there is a dragon giving power and working in these days. Who is it? Well, if you turn back one page, only one page to Revelation chapter 12 and verse nine, you'll see his identification. Verse nine says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Oh, there you go. In chapter 12, verse nine, you've got the identity of the dragon of chapters number 12 and 13. The dragon is the devil. The dragon is Satan. And then in chapter number 13, you have two beasts mentioned. And interestingly, the 18 verses of chapter 13 are divided almost exactly in half, with the first half given to the description of the first beast, and the second half given to the description of the second beast. Verses 1 through 11 describe the first beast, and we know from the description and from the rest of the book of Revelation that the first beast is the Antichrist. That's his identity. He's called the beast, but we call him the Antichrist. That's verses 1 through 11. Then verses number, uh, verse 1 through 10, verses 11 through 18 then describe the second beast whom we know to be the false prophet. So in Revelation 13, you have the dragon, you have beast number one, who is the Antichrist, and beast number two, who is the false prophet. Now, do you notice anything interesting about the fact that these uh, entities, these personages working in the last days are functioning similarly to the divine trinity? Do you notice that? God exists as a divine trinity. We know that God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And in the same way, what Satan does in these last days is that he crafts an unholy trinity. And that trinity marked by Satan himself, and then the Antichrist, and then the false prophet. And they align themselves or they work together rather like the divine trinity, only an unholy or an opposite trinity. Satan, the dragon, if you will, commanding all the head, empowering all that's happening. The Antichrist in the earth, being exalted in the earth and worshiped by all the world. And then the false prophet responsible for pointing all the world to the Antichrist and causing them to worship him. In the same way that God the Father sits upon his throne, Christ came to the earth and is exalted, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit to point people to the exalted Christ. What you have in Revelation 13 is a substitute, Satan's substitute for the divine trinity. Another word that we could use would be a counterfeit. I want you to jot this down somewhere in your notes, and don't forget it. It is an important principle to remember as you live in these days. It is that Satan is a counterfeit artist. Listen to me. Every good thing that God has created for our well-being, for our blessing, for our fullness, Satan comes along and creates a cheap substitute which when we embrace it, ultimately brings us harm and leads to our destruction. Don't fall for Satan's substitutes or Satan's counterfeits. This is what the world will do during the tribulation. They will fall for that 
counterfeit. Now you see this all over life where Satan does this. For example, in relationships, God crafted for our good and our well-being the beauty of a godly family where God designed one man, one woman in a monogamous relationship with the beauty of sexual relations in that love and marriage relationship where the marriage bed is undefiled, where there's commitment and devotion and covenant and love. And yet Satan comes along and says, I have another plan. I have a better plan. We'll substitute covenant for convenience. We'll substitute covenant. For commitment, we will rather live with no commitment. And there might be multiple partners. And there might be the exploitation of sexual pleasure in all sorts of places. And we think that's freedom. And yet you discover it leads you to harm and even destruction. It's one example, but it's true in all different ways in life. Satan is a counterfeit artist always know that God's ways are best. Amen? Don't fall for the cheap counterfeits. Now, there are many examples of that, but the example that we see in Revelation chapter number 13 is in this extraordinary attempt for Satan to supplant the authority of Jesus to counterfeit King Jesus and put in his place a ruler, a king, who will be worshipped by all the world, Satan empowers this anti-Christ, this substitute Christ. Write it down, all campuses, somewhere in your notes. Here's what the Bible teaches us about the last days. During the time of tribulation, the anti-Christ will rule the world. He will rule the world. Now you notice in Revelation 13 that it begins in verse number one with John standing on the beach. He's standing on the sand of the sea and he's looking out over the ocean, the tossing, tumultuous, waves crashing, dark ocean uh, that he's seeing. In the book of Revelation, the sea often represents the chaos, the darkness of the nations without God. And he looks out over this sea of nations in great chaos and confusion, and he sees a beast, verse number two, rising up out of that chaos, out of that turmoil. Now imagine, if you will, the turmoil, the fear, the chaos in a world just having gone through the war, the battle of Gog and Magog. Just having seen the destruction of that war and then there about the same time, the sudden disappearance of a billion or more people around the planet. Imagine... With the battle of Gog and Magog, with the rapture of the church, the chaos, the confusion, the darkness and turmoil that will be in the world. And it will be the perfect scenario, in my estimation, for the Antichrist, the beast of the Antichrist, to rise to power. It's out of that chaos that this empire will emerge and its ruler. In fact, Verses 1, 2, verse number 7, all of these verses speak of both the empire that will rise and the, the ultimate leader or ruler of that empire. Verse number 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw this beast rise up. He describes the beast, seven heads, ten horns. This empire is, a, is a, an alliance of a number of different nations with seven leaders. It's described as a beast. It is savage. The character of this empire and this ruler is beastly. Now, by the way, if you, if you have a King James translation of the Bible and you read in Revelation chapter 4... It says that there are some beasts that are flying around the throne of God. This is a totally different word for beast 
That are, those are the seraphim. The word used for beast in this passage is a word which means savage or even venomous. It is a beastly, uh, savage empire. It's described in verse number two with the features of animals. The beast that I saw, verse two, was like a leopard, which would speak to the speed with which it comes to power and conquers and controls the earth. It had feet like a bear. It would describe the power of the bear. And it had a, it looked like a lion, verse number two uh, said. It looked like a lion, the mouth of a lion, the king of the jungle, this beast that comes to power. In verse number seven, that this says that this beast then is given power by the dragon. Well, verse three says the dragon gives him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Now, interestingly, the word power in verse three is a word which means his ability. So he's given exousia, the right to rule, that's verse seven. But in that right to rule, he's given dunamis, dynamis. He's given the ability to act in the way that he does. This antichrist is satanically empowered. Verse number five says that he's given the ability to speak great words, very persuasive orator, very persuasive in his words. He's given his seat, according to verse number two. It means his throne. He sits upon the throne of the world. And that throne is provided to him by the dragon or by Satan. And of course, that exousia, that great authority over all the world. So this one, out of all the confusion and the chaos of the last days, this empire with its leader, the Antichrist, will arise. He will rule the world in the power of Satan being satanically empowered. Now that empowerment will go so far, according to Revelation 13, as to empower him, Satan will empower him to mimic Christ's resurrection. Remember, Satan is a counterfeit artist and he counterfeits what God has done or what Christ has done. And he does this in a mimicking or a counterfeit resurrection. Three different times in chapter 13, we are told that this beast, the Antichrist, has a wound which is deadly. Let me show it to you. It's in verse 3, verse 12, and verse 14. Look again at verse number 3. I saw as one of his heads were wounded to death. And yet that wound uh, was healed. And then again in verse number 12, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, causing all the earth, uh, causing them which dwell on the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then verse number 14, at the end of the verse, to make an image to the beast, the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Three different times, this beast, this ruler, this antichrist is said to have been wounded in such a way that he died, or at least he nearly died, or at least it was presumed, or he was, he was thought to be dead. And verse 14 makes it pretty clear, doesn't it, that this wound comes from a sword, a weapon. And so he, we would assume, in fact, I think it's safe to go beyond the assumption and say that the Bible says that this this antichrist will in fact be assassinated. He will die or at least he will come to the point of death and then he will miraculously be healed. Now some of you may be thinking, well now pastor, does, does the devil have the power to raise the dead? Satan can't do that, right? The power of life is in the hand of God. Well, you would be correct in saying that. But do you know what I've learned about the Lord in walking with him for 40 years? If you want to know, just say, Pastor, what have you learned? <laughs> Here's what I've learned. He can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Amen? And if God in this special moment wants to give power to, the, to Satan to raise this Antichrist from the dead, he can do that. But be it an actual resurrection or a counterfeit resurrection, here's the end effect. 
that all the world believes that this man has died and he has been raised from the dead. And that resurrection will mimic, counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus and it will lead to the worship of this one called the Antichrist where all the world will worship him. See, the Bible tells us that he will rule, that Satan will give him this power and position and that he will mimic this resurrection. Now, the second thing, or the third thing rather, is that this uh, Antichrist will rule the world peacefully for 42 months. You see this in verse number five. Before we read that verse, let me point your attention to it. Just at least make a note. You can go read it later. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, uh, along with Revelation 6, Daniel 9 explicitly, Revelation 6 intimates this, that the Antichrist comes to power on a, on a platform of peace. He's, he comes into the chaos of the world and he brings about peace. He settles conflicts. He confirms a peace covenant with Israel. He settles uh, uh, the, uh, the, the conflicts in the Middle East. And he does this for a period of seven years. But he begins as a man of peace. He will be a peace broker. He will be an extreme diplomat, a smooth talker, if you will. But halfway through the tribulation period, he will change his tune. Look at verse number five. There was given unto him uh, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to, to continue for 42 months. After which, verse six, he then opens his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And verse seven, to make war with the saints. So for three and a half years, he is a man of peace. Twelve, uh, 42 months is the equivalent on the Hebrew calendar of 1260 days. There aren't 28 days in any Hebrew months. There aren't 31 days in any Hebrew months. All Hebrew months have 30 days and 30 days times 42 months is 1260 days. It is exactly three and a half years. So the seven year tribulation period begins with peace and halfway through it becomes a, a moment when this antichrist is no longer a man of peace, but he turns and begins to claim divinity and to demand worship. The Bible tells us that he will commit at that point in the mid part of the tribulation, 1260 days in, 42 months in, three and a half years into the tribulation, he will commit an event that Daniel calls and Jesus referenced as the abomination of desolation. Paul told us, we read it last week in 1 Thessalonians 4, that he will go into the temple, making the temple desolate, committing an abomination. He will go into the temple and he will claim to be God and he will demand worship. Remember last week, Paul said he is the one who opposes God, who exalts himself above God, who enters into the temple and demands to be worshiped as if he is God. He will turn at the three and a half years after ruling in peace and then he will claim by blaspheming God in verse number six, claiming to be God and making war with the saints. Now Jesus called that moment and the following three and a half years the time of great tribulation, second half of the seven years, a time of great tribulation which the world has never seen before and will never see again. Now this world ruler will rule the world in those ways. Now let me just stop and say before we move beyond this that you and I should not be um, doubtful that such a ruler could come to power, that such an empire could in fact come to power. We shouldn't doubt that. We see globalism happening more and more around the world. Let me define it for you. You know what it is. Globalism is an ideology which essentially seeks to define every person as more of a citizen of the world 
then they are a citizen of a particular nation. And in doing so, to bring together all of the world in one. So that with, with uh, interconnected trade and interconnected economies and interdependent markets, uh, that the world simply becomes one. It is easy to see the world going toward this. In fact, in recent uh, years, uh, globalism has taken on a new term called hyperglobalism or hyperglobalization because this movement now is happening so quickly. And we shouldn't be surprised that in a global world, there could be a global leader. In fact, let me read to you what a man by the name of Paul Henry Spack uh, wrote or said a number of years ago. You say, well, I don't know who Paul Henry Spack uh, was. Let me read you his resume. Uh, Paul Henry Spack was the prime minister of Belgium. He was the secretary general of NATO. He was the chairman of the first general assembly of the United Nations. And he was one of the main architects of the creation of the European Union. Pretty impressive resume. And this is what he said. He said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people. To lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. He then said, send us such a man. And be he God or devil, we will receive him. And I believe that very soon God will allow Satan to bring forth that man. Now restrained, but the world is preparing for this final days of a one world ruler. All right, now, the second thing then about the, these final days during the tribulation, not only will there be one world government, one world ruler, the Bible also tells us in chapter 13 that the entire world will worship this beast. Now, again, over and over, verse 3, verse 4, verse 8, verse 12, verse 15, John leaves no doubt about this universal worship and adoration of this beast who is to come. Verse number three tells us that all the world, after they, particularly after they see this assassination and his resurrection, verse three says, all the world will wonder after the beast. They will be in amazement. They will admire or marvel at this beast. He goes on to say in verse number four, they will worship Satan himself, the dragon, and that the world will worship the beast. Verse number 12 says that all the inhabitants of the world will worship him, that they will worship his image. But verse 8 gives a caveat. There is a group, a small group, which will not worship the beast. Look at verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The verse says all will worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. This this worship will be fostered by, this global worship will be fostered by the false prophet. He will point people to, command people, commanding people to worship this anti-Christ, this beast. This false prophet works in the same power that the Antichrist works in. That's verse number 12. He has the same power as the Antichrist. Verse 13 tells us he performs miracles. Verses 14 and 15 says he creates an image of the beast, even requiring the world to worship the image of the beast. And all the world will do so. Global worship, with the exception, verse number 8 says, of the saints against whom the Antichrist is making or waging war. Now, some of you are thinking right now, and I hear your concern, or maybe I see it in your eyes. You're thinking, wait a minute, Pastor. He's, he's going to be worshipped by the world except for the saints? I'm a saint. I'm a Christian. I thought you said we would be raptured out before these events unfolded. You're exactly right. I did say that, and it is true. The Bible does say that we will be raptured out before the events of the Great Tribulation. I'm convinced of that. So then who are the saints that will be under attack and who will refuse to worship him? 
Well, they will be those tribulation saints that Revelation talks about, those saints who wash their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. These are the people coming to faith in Christ, many of them Jewish people, I believe, who will come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. But they will refuse, but otherwise the world will fall in line and worship. Now, by the way, if this sounds far-fetched to you, never, I mean, with Judaism and, and Christianity and, and uh, Islam and uh, with uh, all the religions in the world, surely there would never be one man worshipped by all the world. Surely not, it wouldn't be true that everybody would fall in line and follow the commands of one centralized power. You don't think so. Were you around in 2020 when COVID came? If COVID taught us anything, it taught us that in a time of great fear, when people are terrified and the government executes authority, most people will fall in line like lambs following the shepherd. This will be a time of fear unseen in our world since the day of creation and all the world will worship him. Verse eight, as I said, only Christ's followers will not But verse 15 gives a warning that those who refuse to worship him will be executed. Verse number 15 says, as many as, at the end of the verse, as many as would not worship him, uh, the image of the beast should be killed. That's not hard to envision that happening. One world ruler who claims to be God and all the world falls in line worshiping him, except those who have given their lives to Jesus. Now, the third and final thing I would say as we close is this. It is that this global rule and this this, uh, global worship uh, will be enforced with the world economy. Jot it down this way. The Antichrist will enforce control with a one world economy. Verses 16 and 17 talk about the mark of the beast. And of course, just saying those words, mark of the beast, brings a lot of intrigue. And a lot of interest and a lot of questions. There's a lot that we don't know. And a lot of speculation has been made about what the mark of the beast is or what it will be. I don't pretend to know exactly, but let's focus on what, we, what is clear. What is clear in the passage is that this mark, whatever it is, will number one, identify a person as compliant or not. It will have the ability to identify whether a person is, uh, is following, is adhering to, is worshiping the beast, or if they have refused to do that. It will also enable transactions, commerce, based on their compliance. So if someone refuses to worship, and so they refuse to take the mark, then they will be locked out of any commerce, any transactions. I mean, this is, this is so easy to do even today. Technology in commerce has gone to the point where we are, have almost become a cashless society. We really, in many ways, have moved away or quickly moving away from the use of cards, plastic. Now we've moved in many cases to the use of devices, When I go to our coffee shop here in Weaverville on a Sunday morning and I go to get a cup of coffee, I pull my iPhone out of my back pocket and I go beep. And immediately between my phone and that little uh, reader, they know if I've got at least $1 in my account and can buy a cup of coffee. It it, it identifies me in an instant. It enables my transaction in an instant. And if I'm overdrawn, it would decline my transaction instantly. In an instant. Well, imagine a day in which if you refuse the mark and you refuse to submit to this world leader and to worship him, you are canceled. And you're not canceled just because they close your Instagram account or your, or your Twitter feed. You're canceled from all of life. You cannot drive a car. You cannot uh, go to the doctor. You cannot buy groceries. You cannot get uh, your prescription filled. You cannot engage in, in the economy in any way. They can cut you off in an instant. You're identifiable, you're can- cancelable. And by the way, that technology is not only coming around, it is already here and is being used 
in parts of Europe and many other places around the world more and more and more extensively. RFID chips now smaller than a grain of rice being inserted under the skin, most often in that fleshy part between your thumb and your forefinger. They can insert an RFID chip there. You don't need to pull your phone out anymore. You just go beep and, and your transaction is done. So my point to you is none of us should say when we read that uh, they'll have to take a mark or they can't buy or sell, we shouldn't go, oh, that's, that's fiction. Are you kidding? We're living in that world right now. So all of that to say that God is in control, moving about the pieces of the chessboard, preparing this world as we see globalism becoming more and more accepted as an ideology around the world, more and more governments surrendering to that ideology, as we see the rise in control of government powers, as we see technology advancing to enable everything that Revolution, Revelation 13 describes, we should know that we're living in the days just prior to the coming of the Lord. Now, what do you do with that on every campus? Well, number one, Paul says in one place that if we have this hope in Jesus that he's coming, we ought to purify ourselves. We ought to live for the Lord to come as if he's coming today. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then you should trust him. You should say, Lord, I don't want to be left behind. When the rapture occurs and the church is taken out, I want to go. I don't want to be here for seven years of tribulation to ultimately die as a worshiper of Satan and the Antichrist. And you can trust in Jesus today. Let me answer a protest some of you may be making in your mind right now, and I'm going to quit. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I don't know if this is true, but I'll tell you one thing. If a billion people disappear tomorrow in, in an event called the rapture, I'll give my life to Jesus then. I'll, I'll trust in Jesus once I see it happen. Can I respectfully say to you, I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it, number one, because I think the Bible teaches if you know, and reject, know of and reject Jesus today, you will not be able to be saved in the tribulation. I think the Bible teaches that. Some might disagree. But I would suggest to you that if you won't live for Jesus today, when in fact in, in our culture it's relatively easy to do so, if you won't live for him today, why would you give your life for him then? You won't. If Jesus is drawing your heart to him today, I, I beg you, Put your faith and your trust in Jesus 